Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to Conversations with the President's College at the University of Hartford. Thank you for tuning in. And we have as our guest, our usual guest, Joel Volker, who's executive director of the President's College, and Joe Mangione. Lou Mangione. Lou, I'm sorry, Lou. Lou Mangione, who is our special guest this evening. Let us go to Joe and tell us what's going on at the President's College. Thanks, Bob. Um, we are really, really active this fall. I'm going to save most of my time for the upcoming spring, which is going to be upon us. We're going to get to the holidays and then spring awfully quickly. Oh, my gosh. But I want to talk about a couple of highlights from the fall. We had our uh, annual symposium, and we had 22 of the local important arts leaders of the organizations from the Athenaeum to Theater Works. Everybody come for a Saturday and talk about the crisis in funding the arts and our hopes and ambitions and the way I see it, Bob, the fact that um, when Hartford turns the corner and becomes one of these really popular cities and the young people all move in, it's going to have a lot to do with our fabulous arts organizations. Well, that was a very, very healthy contribution to the, re the resuscitation of the city of Hartford. I think it will be. Really. Um, and we also had the Thomas Hooker lecture, which we do um, in partnership with the Ancient Burying Ground Society of Hartford, and we had Matt Warshower of Central Connecticut talk about Connecticut in the Civil War. Wow. And that is a fascinating topic. I did not know that our Capitol building is actually an enormous uh, monument to the Civil War, and sad to say that the Connecticut part in the war was not really motivated by the desire to, to free slaves. There were other political reasons that drove Connecticut, um, and some at some times we were known uh, as the Georgia of the South. Not I, nearly as progressive as, say, Massachusetts. I wonder why. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. um, and then also we had a national defense conference. We partnered with the Charter Oak chapter of the Military Officers Organization, and we had a whole day of talking about the hot spots around the globe, like ISIS, Russia, China, and that was a really interesting day as well. And coming up, and I know a lot of our viewers are, not, are going to miss this, and I'm announcing it for this show at the very last minute, but on November 8th, the Juilliard String Quartet will be at heart, our, our, our music school, and they will give a demonstration, lecture, and conversation with the President's College people about how a string quartet communicates. What day of the week is that, please? I don't know, November 8th. Oh, uh, isn't that the Tuesday? Let me be it's, quick to it's, say it's that Tuesday. if you'd like to register for it. Okay. Uh, registering is necessary. I just wonder how you do Tuesday. that. Hartford.edu slash President's College. The price, I looked at it today and um, it's on the program. Uh, good. So it's an easy way to get there. And this is now our main way, Bob, of communicating is to use the website. Are we still answering the phones? Yes. At 860-768-4495? That phone number is still active. Good. And now let me get to the spring semester as quickly as I can. Um, okay. It is a very rich lineup of courses. Um, and we are just now editing the catalog and getting ready to put it online for people to preview and decide which courses they'd like to register for. We'll have it up there uh, probably in the first week of December. Good. So okay. everyone can get their planning done. Um, we are going to have a spring kickoff on January 12th, 
at the uh, 1877 Club. Most of our President's College people know about this, and many, many come year after year, where we get to meet the professors who will be teaching, and there's wine and cheese, and it's a great social occasion for all of our students to, to get to see each other again. Um, so that's coming up. And now for a quick sneak preview of some of our courses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Leslie Daymangla is a Haitian from Trinity College. He's taught there for many years. He's going to do a course on Jews in the Caribbean. There's been a Jewish presence in that area of the world since the 16th century wow. and very influential in the culture. And so there's some things that a lot of people don't know about that, that Leslie has studied for most of his life. They probably got there uh, as a result of the Inquisition. Uh, they, you know, in Spain and Portugal, and uh, the Caribbean was one of their uh, destinations, you know, to flee yeah, persecution. The, the Inquisition. That's okay. right. In fact, I just had lunch with Leslie and he was explaining about Columbus and its simultaneity with the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. Sure. And that's how they got there. Yeah. He is such a learned fellow, this Bob. Oh, oh cut it out. <laughs> Next. Um, astrophysicist Jim McDonald of our college, our Arts and Sciences, is going to talk about the planet Mars. And he's going to talk about both the science and what we've discovered and also its role in our fictional imagination as well. So it's called The Red Planet, Mars. Uh, Mike Schiano, whom I think you, you know, is going to talk about Mozart's dramatic concert concertos. It turns out that the concertos follow the shape of the operas in many ways. Really? And there's actually a kind of a dialogue and drama between the soloist and the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And Mike, you know how, Mike, how good he is at presenting those sorts of things. Yeah. He does a course usually once a year, does he not, uh, tied in with music? Yeah, he's done Beethoven and the Beatles. I was just going to mention that. Yeah. That was thrilling. It truly was a thrilling course. I think I learned more about the Beatles there than any, <laughs> anything I knew ever before. <laughs> exactly. Um, Playhouse in the Park is going to do a production of Eugene O'Neill's Moon for the Misbegotten, really? and the director is studying the biography and the works of Eugene O'Neill, and he'll talk to us about how a director learns as much as he or she can, and then how it gets into the directorial uh, decisions that you make when you move actors around the stage. Hmm. And then the third, that'll be two lectures plus attendance at the show with a talk back afterwards. Wow. So that should be great fun. <clears throat> Frank Rizzo's doing Hamilton the Musical again, yeah. oh. the third time. Really? It, it's the fact yeah. that we just there are so many people so curious about that show who can't get there right. that they want to hear what Frank can tell them about wow. it. Wow, and he certainly has the ability to do that. Yeah, he is a wonderful uh, critic. I, I must say that the composer is from Wesleyan University, Middletown, yes. Connecticut. Alma mater yeah. of? Al 06457. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't everybody yeah. know their zip code of their alma mater? I don't uh, yes. think I do. I do. <laughs> I do. Okay. Uh, Chris Doyle has been doing now for a couple of years our Foreign Affairs Council. Right. And they are going to meet monthly, as they always do, uh, through the spring. And they're going to talk about suburbia, the American diet, um, and changes in the American ideas of sex and gender. So we're going to have some lively topics with Chris this spring. Okay. Uh, Maria Frank, our professor of Italian, uh, is, a, is a translator, and she's going to do a little class on taking Italian poems and then comparing English translations of them to see if by triangulating you can get closer to the actual meaning of the Italian words. Mm. So she's mm. looking for some lovers of poetry okay. to dig into this topic with her. Okay. Um, Richard Freund, I think you know, has discovered yes. that temple, uh, t tunnel, yeah, yeah, ten yeah in, in Vilnius. In Vilna, yeah. In Lithuania. And they're going to, he's going to talk about the process of using the tools like ground penetrating radar and also the rather heroic story of how these people dug their way. Not as many survived as you would hope, but it's a wonderful story and Richard is the man to tell it. Yeah, he just came back uh, recently from Vilna Yeah, and uh, I've heard him talk on this topic at our synagogue and it's electrifying, it really is. The whole process, you know, of how it all transpired and it's, it, it's a wonderful story. And the thing about ground penetrating radar is that with that you don't disturb yes. the dead, right. which is very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, this is a, yeah. such a macabre topic, but Richard has made major progress in archaeology there. Um, Melanie Barbo of the uh, 
Hillstead Museum is going to give a three class, uh, uh, three session class on Theodate Pope, the architect, the daughter who built the museum as their home, and yeah. then on her father's collection of impressionists, mm. and um, also on the, um, the history of the place, his business, et cetera. So it's a kind of family history that, that she's going to offer. I, I used to go to the poet. They used to have sunken. I think they still do. They still do yeah. the sunken garden poetry. Yes. Uh, which uh, they brought in uh, so many budding poets from around the country. Right. And right. Uh, it was a wonderful, and I guess it still is, a wonderful experience there. And so one of the purposes of this course is to get people more aware, more interested in visiting. Yes. I visited uh, Hillstead with my grandson oh, yeah. this summer, and he was very taken with it at the age of five. So it, yep. it's for all, oh, they, it's they for all a, ages. They have a fabulous collection of Impressionist paintings. Oh, yes, I, I've been Absolutely. there many times. Absolutely. Right here in Farmington, yeah. yes. Connecticut. Yep. Um, I wanted to mention, because I know you're taking part one, that Humphrey Tonkin is offering part two of his 16th century. That's the second half of the century, and the history of England as it grew rapidly into a major empire. Right. So I think that'll be a fascinating thing that people will want to continue with. Catherine Stevenson is going to do Jane Austen's Emma, uh, the first, they say, psychological novel. Um, Douglas Highland, the former director of the New Britain Museum for American Art, has put together a class, thinking back over his lifetime, of famous fakes and forgeries of great art really? that he encountered in various ways wow. as an art expert. So there's going to be a little bit of sleuthery and skullduggery, and you learn about art at the same time. Yeah, right. So that should be a, that, I'm sure that's going to be a, um, a big enroller. Uh, Nina Watt of the Heart Dance Program and Catherine Swanson, who's a, a, a composer, are going to do a class on a very, very famous choreography by Jose Limon. And it was called There, there Is a Time, and it's based on Norman Delo Yoyo's Meditations from Ecclesiastes. So the dance fans have something to look forward to this year. I may interject that we went to see 42nd Street at the Hart yeah, School yeah. a couple weeks ago. It was absolutely outstanding. And these were students, you know, from the Hart School who, who put this on, and um, they did a spectacular job. You can have a Broadway experience right here in West Hartford. You're right. Because of the talent of those kids. Yep. yep. Um, I love this. Amanda Walling of our English department is going to offer a course called Love, Sex, and Marriage in the Middle Ages. Really? <laughs> and I don't know if you're aware of this, but domestic violence was worse in the Middle Ages in England than it is in America today. I'm sure. And of course, people couldn't get divorced, so one had to outlive the other. And there are ways to speed that process along. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder I can imagine how. the plots that... But this is about love yeah. as well as sex and yeah. marriage, so it should yeah. be great. She knows a great deal about that. Uh, Michael Robinson, our, a historian, mm -hmm. is going to talk about um, Connecticut in the space age. Power Booth, who always gets very cosmic about art, is going to talk about complexity, the irrational, and the way in which it leads us to new insights about some of our greatest artists. Um, and, you know, I could go on, but I want to stop there because I want to make sure that we have time to talk with Lou Manzione. Okay. Uh, Lou is the Dean of Engineering, Technology, and Architecture um, and has been at the university since 2005. Okay. And I'm proud to say that I was on the search committee that <coughs> hired so Lou. Was there. And brought him from AT&T, I believe yes, you were Bell previously. Labs. I, I had a career at uh, Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey. In New Jersey? Yes. Oh, no yeah. kidding. It's a famous place. And also you were stationed in Ireland for a while. Yes, and I actually, be right before I arrived here, I was building Bell Labs in Ireland. So this was an initiative wow. partnered with the uh, Irish government uh -huh. to bring a Bell Labs location to Ireland. And hmm. it's been very successful. It's uh, going strong to this day. Wow. Is, is Bell Labs still in uh, New Jersey? Yes, the, their headquarters where, where is still is M Murray Hill, New Jersey. Oh, Murray Hill? So it's near Summit, New Jersey, Central oh, yes. New Jersey. As I would say, which exit? It's 142. <laughs> I, I know it very well. <laughs> right, right, right off of yes, uh, Route what is 78. Yeah, okay. Uh, and Lou also has just been named um, Director of Collaborative <coughs> Research and Economic Development for the University of Hartford. 
Um, and I'll let Lou explain that, but there's two reasons why I'm particularly delighted to have him here. He's about to give a, cor a, a lecture for us at Duncaster on December the 6th on the Internet of Things, up to Lou to, des to describe that, but I'd also like him to talk a little bit about his new position and what it means for our community. I hope we have enough time, Lou, to go through all of this. I just want to make one comment, if I may, about your uh, presentation, that if people want to see this uh, in their hands, and they, they, they want to read and reread what's being offered in the second semester, can they still dial 768-4495? Operators are ready to take your name and number so that... They can do that. Or... They can print it off. Or we do mail at the beginning of each semester. Yes. The thing that we've stopped doing is the monthly updates Good. through through yep. the paper mail. Yep. That got really expensive, but, the, but okay. they will get a hard copy. Okay. That is, if people want to read up and register and all that, uh, that's how to get a, you know, a, a, a questionnaire and a... a, a way to get to these classes. Right. Okay. Lou, you, let's talk yes. about you. Well, you told us a little bit about your Bell Lab experience. How long, have, again, have you been at the university? It's 11 years now, 2005. Okay. 2006. And what have you been doing there? What's, what's well, your... Well, I've been uh, involved in a lot of things. Yes. So I've been the dean of the College of Engineering, Technology, and Architecture. We've had you know, significant growth in, in these areas o over the years, so the college is now 1,200 students. So that's significantly larger than it was back in 2005. Oh, sure. We're very happy about that. Sort of confirmation that we're, we're doing a good job. Um, we were recently named 14th in the nation in mid-career salaries of our graduates. Isn't that fabulous? Yes, that now truly this is. is you know quite a distinguished list. It I mean, is. Stanford is number one, and yeah. Princeton is number two, and we're fourteenth in the nation in uh, mid-salary, mid-career salaries of our graduates. That's we're tied with MIT, with Carnegie Mellon, yeah. with, with Tufts at, at number fourteen. So we're very proud of that. Um, our graduates do a really great job. Our faculty do a great job in preparing them for the job market, and then they do exceptionally well in their careers. What is the depth of the faculty there at the University of Hartford in your department? Well, we have about 50 full-time faculty. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're spread over a multiple, uh, you know, multiple disciplines. Of course, some of our bigger programs are mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. We have computer engineering. We have civil engineering. We have biomedical engineering. We have an architecture program, both oh. at the undergraduate and at the graduate level. Um, so uh, those are, uh, we have an audio engineering technology, works in music production. One of our students was recently an intern at the Summer Olympics in Rio de Janeiro. Terrific. So a yeah. number of programs, uh, graduates all do very well. Uh, and, you know, we really enjoy a very good uh, job market here in Connecticut. Good to hear. So is this the first time you have worked with the President's College, you know, as far as giving lectures and all that? No, I've, I've given several lectures, enjoyed every one. We always get a good audience. Yes. Uh, I've worked with Joe on a number of technical topics that we've presented at the, uh, the President's College. There's always a lot of keen interest, and I get some just terrific questions. Yep. Um, at Duncaster, at other places, um, I've spoken at the Farmington Library, other places, Gr great audience, very good question. So I enjoy really? my involvement with the well, President's what, what College. What are the demographics of the people that show up to your lectures? I mean, at Duncaster, it would be somewhat of a more senior population. Yes. However, they're very well read. They're very up on latest technology. I get a lot of good questions. And so a, a lot of interest, really, in some of these So now, specifically, questions. what is going to be, what are you going to be covering uh, at your Duncaster lecture? The, the topic is of the Internet of Things. So um, this is sort of an emerging technology. Well, we all know the Internet and how we connect to it. The Internet of Things is that there'll be other devices. It could be things like fitness uh, trackers. A Fitbit is a common commercial, commercial name. It could be alarm clocks. It could be thermostats. It could be products like locomotives while they're chugging along the track, we'll be relaying information back, let's say, into the cloud 
that will be doing some type of analysis and fine tuning that locomotive, fine tuning that jet engine to sort of constantly optimize it, make, uh, take advantage of the latest algorithms that are available from the producers of this equipment to constantly upgrade, improve these devices. Is this a relatively new discipline? The Internet of Things has been talked about for a while, but there's a couple of trends that are really driving. It's, it's very rapid now, implementation and, and acceptance. Once is, is the continued uh, decrease in the cost of computing and the cost of memory. So you see now, I mean, you could sign on for a Yahoo email account or a, a Gmail account. I mean, they give you 15 gigabyte of data. I mean, you really never have to delete an email in your life with that kind of memory yeah. that you get for free, in a sense, for, si mm -hmm. for signing up. So memory is very inexpensive, and then computing power has become very inexpensive, such that all these devices, which are collecting all this information from products, from mm -hmm. your alarm clock, from your coffee maker, from your thermostat, mm -hmm. it'll be moving up into the cloud, doing some analysis, because now computing is very inexpensive. A fairly sophisticated computer is now a couple of dollars. So now, do you cover s most of this in uh, classes that you teach or are, are being taught at the, at the University of Hartford? We don't have a specific class right now on Internet of Things. We have several projects with some companies yes. on, on Internet of Things. I mean, because of course, this monitoring is catching on with companies. They want to use it to sort of monitor their products in the field. So there's some projects that we're, 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 we're um, entering upon, but there are no, what would I say, courses yet. It's, it's still an emerging area. We're, we're building those courses, but the, the technology is, will have some profound effects, however, sure. on everyday life. Are there other schools in the region who cover issues like this? I assume that they do. I don't know of uh, other classes there. I mean, this is, of course, closely related to the field of cybersecurity because all of these new Internet sites, yep. basically the Internet of Things is machines talking with machines. Okay. And so in itself, this kind of introduces some new risks to the Internet and to cybersecurity. When we talk about hackers, what is hacking into a, a server? Well, hacking is, in a sense, an unauthorized, inappropriate access into an account or a server. Um, the Internet of Things, in a sense, provides some additional risks. So, I was, was it February 21st? Okay. Friday, February 21st was a major distributed denial of service event in the United States. In three waves during the course of that Friday, uh, there was a distributed denial of service attack. That means millions of these Internet of Things devices, things like nanny cams, things like Internet enabled thermostats, all of a sudden began bombarding the servers with requests for service. Why that particular day? It just by chance or? No, it was, by it, was design. it was clearly by design to disrupt those servers and therefore Twitter, PayPal and other um, sites were you know, temporarily unavailable because they were being bombarded by request for service through these Internet of Things terminals. Bombarded by whom? by the devices themselves. See, and that's, that's the interesting thing in Internet of Things. It's machines talking to machines. It wasn't people asking for access okay. at, to these servers. It was machines like thermostats, nanny cams, and other things. They have kind of less security than a laptop computer does or, or even our smartphones. So a, a lot of them are password protected. You don't realize that a nanny cam had password protection. A lot of them were operating under their default password. Wow. Hmm. And so therefore the hackers just tried the default passwords and just realized that millions of people never changed the password from the default setting. Oh, I catch. Until we make this public and make people aware of it, that's a kind of a normal thing to assume. 
it's just my camera in my refrigerator, how can anybody connect to it, right? Right, yeah. And that's right. So there'll be now sort of a new awareness of the risk that these kind of devices that are connected and are portals to the internet sort of introduce that kind of risk. Do people, when you give your talks and your, you know, your, your course, do people understand what you're talking about? I think that they do. Uh, otherwise, I mean, Joe would not have invited me back if... Um, <laughs> because I'm a little lost, if you yeah. want to know the truth of the matter. I was, as I would always say, I was born in the 19th century and I will die in the 19th century. <laughs> and this really is a little... Uh, bizarre for me to, to understand and to comprehend exactly what you're talking about. Okay, so the, I, I, I could try to sort of put it into different, different terms. Yeah. So we, we access the internet, but so I could give, maybe the best thing we do would be to talk about examples. So lots of people okay. wear a fitness tracker. I think Joe has one on right, right now. Yep. So let's say the fitness tracker now could also monitor your sleep because it has certain motion sensors in it that track the number of steps, mm -hmm. but it could right. also track how you move around. And so it could actually predict what stages of sleep you're in, you know, deep REM sleep or other kinds of sleep. So, but now what happens if the fitness tracker ties in with your alarm clock, hmm. right? Yeah. And it says, well, you're really not having a good night's sleep. I'm going to push your alarm clock back 20, 30 <laughs> minutes. This is now all in yeah. the realm of the possible uh, with Internet of yeah. Things. And you mentioned the coffee pot one time. Now here's the other thing. So now your alarm clock ties into your coffee pot. And it says, I'm waking him up 30 minutes later, delay starting the coffee for 30 minutes. Is this supposed to make a person happier or <laughs> what well, is Well, it's supposed to simplify our lives. A yeah. long time ago at Bell Labs, we had those conversations, is that one purpose of the cloud and of the network would be to simplify people's lives. Yeah. And so this is kind of all towards that sort of grand aim of simplifying people's lives, that you wouldn't have to make these conscious decisions. So now, Joe, let's just review the bidding here. This gentleman is going to give a talk at Duncaster when, on this very topic, right? Yes. When, again, give me the date. December the 6th. December the 6th. Do we have him scheduled to offer this whole concept at the President's College in the remainder of the year? Well, no, not for next semester, but um, I think that it, it happens often at the President's College that people will hear a lecture and say, well, there's a lot more to that. Do you think you could invite him back for a course? Mm. And then I have to try to twist Lou's arm to come back and give a three-session course on the okay. topic. That's the way we do it. Okay. Yeah. Well, are you amenable to giving? Yes, I, I've, I've spoken on this topic before. Okay. So actually, this is the second time that I'm speaking at the President's College on this very topic. Wonderful. A lot has happened yeah, yeah. Right, in, right, in, right. The, in the last time, and the, and the topic is very much in the, in the news these days. Now, a well, fascinating aspect that Lou has worked on is the elderly, because if you want to be independent and you're getting up there in years and you're living in an apartment, um, there are ways in which your children can know if you're, if you're healthy. Are you moving around the apartment? Sensors can tell. Right. Um, does your voice, remember this job? Yes, Luke, yeah, we, 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 we we're monitoring voice because voice ties into sort of what mental a, state. And yeah. Well, you this could, is a you whole. You can detect depression. Right. Yeah. This, this is a whole area <clears throat> of expertise. Uh, that I guess you're, you know, unique in being able to explain all this and hold people's, you know, imagination to know what you're talking about. I mean, I, it would take me four or five sessions to get to know any of it. But yeah. anyhow, thank you very much, Lou, for, for coming here, explaining to me and everybody else out there uh, what, what this, uh, again, the topic is... The Internet of Things. The Internet of Things. Well, Joe, we could go to Duncaster on that day and hear the opening salvo of this whole topic. And ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to come to Duncaster. Right, Joe? Absolutely. You're welcome to hear Lou talk about the Internet of Things. Thank you very much for coming. 
Joe, thank you for your Thanks, input. Bob. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Good night. <laughs>